Hey everybody, welcome to the inaugural episode of the Arkham Sessions. My name is Brian Ward, and as always going forward, my co-host is Dr. Andrea Letamendi. Hi there. She has a PhD in clinical psychology, and if you're a comic book fan, you may recognize her name from DC Comics as she has appeared as herself as Barbara Gordon's therapist in Gail Simone's Batgirl in the New 52. That's right. The character, Andrea Letamendi, appears um, in issue number 16 as Batgirl's clinical psychologist to help her through some tough times as, um, as a superhero. And she's also acted as a consultant for writers for not only DC Comics, but also Marvel Comics, as well as other fictional writers. Um, and you've got your own blog, UnderTheMaskOnline.com. Under the Mask is essentially my opportunity to talk about fictional characters, heroes and villains, and just have some deep analysis from the psychological perspective about um, some of these characters that we love. You may recognize Brian. He is a DVD and Blu-ray producer for Shout Factory. Many of his most recognized titles are actually animated series from uh, our childhood, including Transformers G1, that's Generation 1, Transformers Prime, G.I. Joe, and My Little Pony, probably... The most masculine of all the things I've worked on. Yes. Uh, Friendship is magic. Yeah, so, so essentially every week going forward, you're going to hear a clinical psychologist and a guy who's watched a whole lot of cartoons uh, as a career um, watching Batman the Animated Series. That's right. This series, I know, holds a really deep meaning for you particularly. What is your own personal connection to Batman the Animated Series? Um, it is, I would say, single-handedly the you know, medium, the thing that brought me to know and understand Batman and Batman's universe, right? It was, as a child, it was my... Um, I guess the the gateway into comic books, into Gotham City, and really, um, I from the get go just fell in love with the series. So for me, this series has sort of a personal. Um, I have a personal relationship with it in that every time I see it, I have this nostalgic experience. It has taught me a great lot about Batman, but also from my professional, um, I guess, perspective that. Um, it's interesting that this show um, really is, to me, presents itself like a series of case conceptualizations or, or case files where with each episode, you really, um, as you know, through the eyes of Batman, you see these villains and these characters, um, you know, you see their motivations, you see their behaviors, you see a lot of times the consequences of their behaviors. And despite it being an animated, uh, ostensibly for kids, lighthearted series, it really is a, a very deep analytical medium for Batman. How about you? Um, well, for me, it was, uh, I was a huge fan of Batman growing up. I would read all of the comics um, since about 1984. I was constantly watching the, um, the original 60s Batman series with Adam West and Burt Ward. And, and I, I just loved the Tim Burton movie when I was growing up. Um, so to then see them take that tone and turn it into an animated series that aired every weekday, to me that was just awesome. Um, but I couldn't watch it as it aired live, as I was always at football practice in the afternoons, so my parents would actually videotape it for me, and I would come home and watch it every day. Uh, and, and to be perfectly honest, I, I probably haven't seen most of these episodes since the 90s, so I'm really excited to, to be given the opportunity to sit here and watch them again, uh, in order, uh, really from a fresh perspective as an adult. Right. So we'll have an analytic perspective and we'll also have the perspective of someone who has watched a ton of cartoons. One could ask the question, why choose uh, an animated series if you're going to go in, in depth on psychological analyses of, of these characters? But 
really one of the important things that we want to establish is consistency. Um, any comic book writer, and in some cases people who aren't comic book writers, can write a Batman story. Um, a story written by David Goyer and Jonathan Nolan and, and, and Christopher Nolan is going to be a lot different than a story written by Jeff Loeb or written by Frank Miller or, write, or, or written by, um, you know, Frank Robbins. I mean, like, any one of these people who picks up a pen and paper or a typewriter or a computer and decides they want to write a Batman story will have their own take on all of these characters. Batman the Animated Series, like any animated series, comes with a writer's Bible. And that is a Bible established by the, the people who developed the show. These guys would have needed to create a writer's Bible so that any writer coming in off the streets writing for the show would have to adhere to the rules that these guys set forth. So no character could really change dramatically over the course of the series. For someone who's going to analyze a character uh, and look at every episode as, like, a session, you, of course, need consistency. So we are going with Batman the Animated Series, uh, which had how many episodes in its first season? Um, in its first season, I think 65? 65. 65, yes. 65 episodes is pretty standard for any show that's going to run five days a week. Apparently right. this is very important to, to studios and networks. Right. Is the number of, how many times are you going to repeat this episode? And in this particular case, we know that uh, it's no more than four times a year. Wow. This is why you're here. Because in my mind, all I remember is as, as a 12-year-old girl, I would rush home from school and every weekday... I'd watch a new episode of Batman the Animated Series. So I have no understanding or appreciation of sort of the, um, you know, the business behind that or, or you know, uh, TV series and how that works. Let's, let's get started. Um, we will get started on today's episode. We're starting with the pilot uh, on Leather Wings. This episode first aired on September 6th, 1992. Um, and oddly enough... They decided for a pilot episode of Batman to focus on the villain Man Bat. Um, well, not so odd if you have dyslexia. Then that would make perfect sense. Makes perfect sense. So, um, but I agree with you in the sense that Man Bat is not um, sort of a villain, a Gotham City villain that you think of immediately when you ask about. Yeah, um, Gotham Man, City's villains. Yeah, Man Bat is not synonymous with with Batman. Like no. you don't you don't think you think Penguin, you think Joker, you think Catwoman, you you think um, Mister Freeze. Like any of these characters, Scarecrow, even um, any of these characters. Like you can start with these characters, um, but you wouldn't necessarily jump at the chance to like tell a story about Man Bat. Where did Man Bat come from pre Batman the Animated Series? Well. Um, this character has actually been around since 1970. Uh, he, was, he was introduced in Detective Comics number 400, which was written by Frank Robbins, illustrated by Neil Adams, um, two legends in the Batman franchise. And uh, Man Bat was uh, Dr. Kirk Langstrom. He was a biologist who, or a, you know, he focused on bats. Uh, he was in the process of going deaf. And uh, he wanted to give himself sonar sense. Uh, and with that sonar sense, and, and so he created this serum that when injected, he transformed himself into a bat. It gave him the sonar sense he was looking for. Um, it also gave him a heightened agility, heightened strength, um, endurance, uh, the ability of flight, obviously, uh, with his gigantic wings. Uh, but the problem is it actually reduced his intelligence. Um, and the only way that you could counter it is if you gave him the antidote, which then reverted him back to Dr. Langstrom. Um, you know, and, and that's sort of how Batman would defeat him on a regular basis. Right. So in his physical transformation to Man Bat, he also acquires the neurological makeup of a bat, meaning his IQ is like tremendously low. He's right. not really functional intellectually as man bat. He's, he's physically um, sort of 
very powerful, right? But yeah. he he can't he doesn't have his intellect anymore. Much more agility, much more strength, much more uh, really everything except brain power. Incredibly stupid. Very very <laughs> is what you're looking for. Very bat like. Um, so this particular episode. Uh, opens up. It it was written by Mitch Bryan. It was uh, directed by Kevin Altieri, um, and it opens up with a burglary of a pharmaceutical company. Uh, pharmaceutical. Ooh, that's a you surprisingly difficult word to say. It's a pharmaceutical company, um, Phoenix Pharmaceuticals, if I remember correctly. Right. Yes, it is Gotham City's most renowned. No, I have no idea. But yes, it is Phoenix I imagine, apparently, actually, we find out in this episode that apparently Gotham City has a lot of pharmaceutical companies. There are many to break into and steal um, right. chemicals from, yes. Look here, there were two very quiet burglaries at other pharmaceutical companies this week. Yeah, so someone is stealing something from this pharmaceutical company. Um, they Ironically, attack... they're probably all owned by, you know, Wayne, Wayne Industries, Industries yeah. which is sort of... You know, maybe that is part of the reason why Batman is particularly upset about these crimes is that they are stealing from him. So there is a uh, there is a burglary at Phoenix Pharmaceuticals. Something is being taken. Um, a guard is attacked and uh, launched out of the building. Luckily, the building is surrounded by what seems to be a moat. As and as they do, you know, <laughs> they actually show him land into this body of water that looks very much like a moat just outside the building. And I, I imagine this is because, um, you know, the show doesn't necessarily show uh, death and murder. So they probably wanted to show him survive this. And in fact, the next day, um, is it Commissioner Gordon who opens the paper and sees the, the headlines that this guard was brutally thrown out of a window and suffered all of these... Uh, but lived. Yes, lived. Um, but the guard is blaming Batman. Gotham police declare war on Batman. I gather you've been reading how to make friends and influence people. Somebody's setting me up. The guard must also be dyslexic <laughs> because he is blaming Batman. Uh, for In fairness, he is a giant man. He is closer to Batman than Batman is. <laughs> right. Yes, uh, right. that is true. So, so he's blaming Batman. The newspaper is um, is spreading this. Fear of Batman now, which I guess kind of serves Batman's whole point to begin with. But uh, but that, that makes the mayor and the police force, particularly Detective Bullock, uh, none too happy. I want my own tactical squad for the sole purpose of throwing a net over this Batman. Commissioner? I've already denied the request. Nobody's taking a vigilante force onto my streets. Commissioner Gordon maybe not so thrilled about that idea because he realizes that this guy could actually be more help if he's on the loose than than not, and it doesn't really seem to fit Batman's M.O. robbing a pharmaceuticals company. So Commissioner Gordon very much against this idea, um, and so is our hero Bruce Wayne slash Batman. Um, he reads the paper and decides that he's going to find out who's behind these crimes and goes to investigate. He ends up finding uh, a bit of evidence, which he takes to the zoo, the Gotham City Zoo. And uh, there he comes across um, Dr. March. You donate a few million and you think you own the place. I understand I'm to analyze something for you? Yeah, Doc. See, I keep hearing squeaks in my chimney and I found these in my empty fireplace. They look like hairs. I thought maybe you could tell me if I have a bat problem. And what if they are bats, Mr. Wayne? What then? Destroy them like insects? We won't survive the next evolutionary cataclysm, but bats will. They're survivors, Mr. Wayne, not pests. You should understand that. We are later told that the, the hair samples and the audio samples that, that Batman has acquired <laughs> are nothing more than common brown bats and that he's got nothing to worry about. That hair wasn't a brown bat's. We are told by the computer, which is very similar to, uh, 
I would say I would say even it's an animated series, but I would say that it's very similar to the 1960s Batman in that the computer it, it's it's very informative. Instead of printing out a piece of paper that tells Batman what it is, though, th this one comes with a voice. Negative. Sound not originated by either species. No match. No match. No match. So, mysteriously, Dr. March is lying. He's lying. And I'm gonna find out why. Oh, Batman's mad. He's upset he about He doesn't that. like liars. Yeah. And I think this is where the episode, you know, really picks up. Yeah. We're, we're also introduced to... Uh, Dr. Kirk Langstrom, who I, I guess, if I remember, is Dr. March's um, son-in-law. He's married to his daughter, who's who you do, also... Who you do meet as well, and she's also a scientist. She's in the episode two or three times and, you know, is um, seemingly unaware of any malpractice or, or evil doing. She sort of comes across as... Um, you know, an ethical scientist, I would say. Sure, absolutely, yeah. Um, in fact, everybody seems on the up and up, um, except for Dr. March. What, what we find out in this um, analysis and then through the, the progress of, of events is that what's actually happening is that various pharmaceutical companies are, are being robbed of seemingly benign chemicals, but when put together, they are the formula to create a totally new species, neither man nor bat. Because bats, uh, as we learned from Dr. March in the beginning, will move beyond the next stage of evolution, whereas um, humanity will not. So I guess we're meant to perceive that, that in a way to keep the human race going, we have to then blend it with something else that's going to move forward. And so they do so with uh, bats. Um, but Batman goes into the lab and finds that it's not actually Dr. March that is uh, using this serum. He's just a theorist. He was afraid to put it to the test. Kirk Langstrom, on the other hand, has those guts and more very much willing to use this serum, um, and does so. And once I started taking it, I couldn't stop. I desperately wanted to, but it took over and uh, becomes man bat <laughs> and that leads into a uh, fisticuffs um, in the air yeah in the throughout the air yeah I mean like you can't you can't really reason with a creature that doesn't have much intelligence so you really have to beat it up and um, the animators do a fantastic job of carrying this this brawl throughout Gotham City. And it, it ultimately ends with Man Bat unconscious being taken back to the Bat Cave. Maybe I can undo the fate Langstrom has brought upon himself. Does it appear feasible, sir? I think so. Batman developing an antidote and delivering him back to his wife. What was your, the ending very much looked like he was not going to Arkham Asylum. No, the ending, the ending to me, because he delivers him, he delivers him wrapped up in Batman's cape. Um, and he's swaddled. Presumably so, so that we don't see that he's been fully transformed back yet. Like he's, he's just a being who's being carried by Batman, carried in his cape. Um, and when uh, she comes out to greet them and, you know, I, I hope everything's okay, Batman unveils Dr. Langstrom. He has been cured. She asks if it's going to happen again. And Batman informs her. The formula's out of his system. We're all meant to believe at the end of this episode, Man Bat is no more. So he doesn't really need to go to Arkham. I find that he's a, li a little bit lenient on him, but I wonder if it's because that Dr. Lanestrom as Man Bat has no sort of understanding or cognition that he is also Dr. Langstrom. So one thing that came up for me when watching this was, is this sort of the classic Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde scenario, where as Man Bat, he doesn't have any recollection of Dr. Langstrom's identity and vice versa. Right. Um, what is your sense of that? Do you think that that's this case? There is the suggestion that 
that Langstrom might remember having been Man Bat in that he is aware of the transformation. There is certainly a... Uh, if Man Bat is the one carrying out these crimes, then, then there is certainly some bit of motivation. Man Bat has to know what he's going after, and he has to know why. So you would need this character to have some bit of back and forth, but that could also be written away as, you know, it's a cartoon. I don't know. So let's go through, as we will in every episode of this podcast, we've just described the episode, um, but now let's go into the characters and the motivations and you as a psychologist, Drea, let's, let's talk about maybe what we would do with these characters. Hey, what's up, Doc? My goal is to increase awareness and knowledge of psychology, including mental health disorders, and part of that means reducing the stigma and misconceptions associated with mental health disorders. Just because somebody has been diagnosed with a mental health disorder, that does not mean that they are in turn a villain or evil or capable of evil doing. So hopefully this information will be somewhat educational, but the purpose again is to um, really try to come to a psychological understanding of each of these characters that we're going to be meeting and knowing well throughout the series. Let's talk about On Leather Wings. Well, the interesting thing here is that we don't go to get, we don't have a good sense of uh, Dr. Langstrom's origin story, that we know a couple of things, right? We know that he has engaged in these crimes, or Dr. March and him have, have collaborated to engage in these crimes to acquire these chemicals so that mm-hmm. he, he can become Man Bat. But my sense, in that scene, when he transforms, it's really quite terrifying. It's done really well. Um, He's like laughing maniacally as he transforms into this grotesque, giant, you know, eight-foot bat, uh, man bat. And um, he keeps his pants on, which I appreciate. Sure. I think that's important. We don't want to see his man junk. No. But yeah, the series does a, does a nice job of showing us um, what that transformation looks like. This is not his first transformation. Right. So this episode hints at his origin, but doesn't provide us with his origin story. So just like somebody maybe coming into my office and presenting with you know a series of problems or behaviors, um, the origin has to be told to me. So I don't know exactly how he came to be Man Bat, just that he is Man Bat at this Mm -hmm. point. Yes. Throughout this episode, he's clearly engaging in criminal activity. Yes. He and Dr. March are, you know, stealing from these pharmaceutical companies. He, as Man Bat, is, uh, you know, throwing guards out the window that could have killed that man. We don't know if the intent was murder. So, you know, you have sort of these levels of criminal behavior that can be important in deciding what he's suffering from. He also, as both Dr. Langstrom and Man Bat, has this sense of superiority. You know, Dr. Langstrom is speaking about this superior being and that his um, his plan to uh, join with bat biology or that a, a superior species would involve bats, you know, it's... It's very out there. It's very outlandish. Um, But it also is very sort of grandiose that he has the ultimate idea of how to save humanity. And that is what we would call kind of diagnostic in and of itself. Somebody who has these grandiose ideas um, and would actually carry out all of these crimes in order to meet those objectives. Other than that, we aren't seeing a lot of, I guess, psychological depth that could lead to one particular disorder or another. Um, Something that I've already talked about was Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, which is the fictional version of what split personalities would be. And so, you know, if we thought of it that way, that maybe Dr. Langstrom slash Man Bat have this version of split personality. Back in the day, this used to be called multiple personality disorder. Um, Now in our current, in the current psychological field, it is called dissociative identity disorder or DID. Um, While people kind of throw around the idea of split personality and DID, I have to say, and hopefully clarify, this is an extremely rare 
an unscientific mental illness, that very few cases have really been proven to meet criteria, diagnostic criteria for the split personality phenomenon. So just based on etiology alone, just based on prevalence of that problem, I would say that's not likely what Dr. Langstrom slash Mambet is experiencing. Um, and one th reason for that is what you and I kind of talked about before, which is, well, does he have recollection of one identity when he is the other? So as man bat, does he have a recollection of what it's like to be Dr. Langstrom? As Dr. Langstrom, does he have some, I, some recollection of the experience of man bat? And I say that because the sort of defining feature of dissociative identity disorder is having the at least two discrete separate identities and, and not having recollection of the other one. As Dr. Langstrom, as just that one identity, he is presenting with some pretty serious symptoms and characteristics that despite the whole man bat thing, this scientist is unethical, he's committing crimes, he has these narcissistic tendencies, and he's willing to carry out anything possible in order to meet his, his objective. Another possible diagnosis or illness that we may consider is this disorder called narcissistic personality disorder. Uh, narcissistic personality disorder is characterized by having, a, as I said, a grandiose sense of self-importance, um, really sort of exaggerating one's talents, expecting others to recognize him or her as superior, um, and not not really having uh, you know the stuff to back that up. With um, people with narcissistic personality disorder also have. Uh, this preoccupation with fantasies of unlimited success, of power, of you know brilliance, and I think that Dr. Langstrom falls into that category, or, or can certainly be characterized as someone who has this fantasy. I mean, I think even I would say maybe his wife would consider his dream of these this bat species to be particularly fantastical and really out there. Another characteristic of narcissistic personality disorder is having this strong sense of entitlement, uh, expecting, you know, I think that entitlement speaks to these crimes that he's making, that whatever he has to do, he's going to steal all these chemicals. It doesn't matter what they're for. You know, we, we can probably imagine that those, those um, medical supplies and chemicals might be for the use of treatments and interventions for people with actual problems or actual medical illnesses. Um, but as I said, he's sort of above it all. He's exploitative of others. He lacks empathy. He's sort of unwilling to recognize the feelings of others. And, um, you know, again, shows some the sense of arrogance. He, um, you know, has this idea of what humanity should be. Um, so he's single-handedly making this decision for the rest of humanity. So I think above all of, you know, if we look at all of these behaviors and motivations together, we may say that he's more likely to fall into the category of narcissistic personality disorder with the addition of some of the this, you know, criminal activity that can really happen with any uh, person, actually, depending on, on what they're, they're going through. So, so how would you go about treating that sort of disorder? Well, you know, ostensibly, if he's finished with um, transforming into man bat, like let's say at the end of the episode, he is, you know, he doesn't have access to these chemicals. He's decided that he's not going to consume the serum and, and not act as man bat. Um, we would probably look at what are the remaining symptoms that need to be addressed and what is he willing to work on. So he might, you know, it could be just a matter of he has... He is, um, tr we need to keep him from committing these crimes, which is sort of in another territory. It's not necessarily mental health. It's more about, you know, enforcement. Are, is he going to go to jail? Is he going to go through rehabilitation? You know, what is that going to look like? On the other hand, does he still carry these ideas of superiority, these grandiose plans, um, this expectation that others should treat him as superior, that I think is dealt with in more intensive psychotherapy where a clinician would sit down with him and really explore these beliefs and actually try to challenge these beliefs and bring him down to a more rational sense of attitudes about the self, 
their relationships and their world. Perfect. Uh, so one of the things I like to do is to associate these fictional characters with people who could be perceived as very real. Um, it, it helps ground these characters into reality. You might not necessarily think of Man Bat as a lifelike, reality-based character. There are actual mad scientists who have attempted to do things like what they're doing. You may not know this, but there was actually a, a biologist named uh, Dr. Uh, Ilya Ivanovich Ivanov, who is a biologist who specialized in the artificial insemination and had these uh, outrageous experiments with uh, chimpanzees and humans, where he very much wanted to, through artificial insemination, create a man-ape hybrid that, um, according to some, was ordered by Joseph Stalin in order to create a, a race of super beings, uh, ape men, that could help communist Russia become the powerhouse that would rule the world. And in some cases, um, some people believe that, that he was basically doing it just because he was a scientist and believed that he could, so why not? And um, this guy actually tried his experiments in several um, areas, he, he tried them in Russia, he tried them in Paris, um, he tried them in Africa. Uh, ultimately, he was sort of shot down everywhere, but he did actually try these experiments. He had 13 chimps, three of which he actually tried to inseminate. Um, well, now, when you say inseminate, with what human, are you saying here? Human. Like, he, he had injected these... These primates he, with human... He injected the man bat with Batman I... stuff. <laughs> he, <laughs> no, he, he, he actually tried to inseminate female chimps with male sperm to create... Human. Human, human, male, human sperm. male sperm. to create um, these, this new species. Um, over the course of the experiments... Uh, not necessarily due to the experiments, but, but over the course of the experiments, all the chimps died. None of them got pregnant. Um, he basically considered this a failure, so then decided uh, the best possible way would go to the, the reverse. And um, he needed a minimum of five women to volunteer to carry ape man babies. Um... And ultimately, nothing succeeded. He couldn't. Uh, the only viable male ape, uh, in this case, was an orangutan who um, had died before they had gotten an opportunity to get everything that they needed from him. Um, so no females were ever um, inseminated. So eventually, this very controversial doctor, um, Ivanov, was, was arrested, um, and he received five years sentence of exile to uh, Alma-Ata in, in Kazakh, where he ended up working for the um, Kazakh uh, Veterinary Zoologist Institute. I'm not sure I would let him do that. What? His, so wait, wait, his punishment was, here's a job? Yeah, here's a job working in veterinary zoology. That doesn't make any sense. Uh, you know, but, but he, he worked there. Um, he actually eventually died of a stroke in um, March of 1932. I was hoping you'd say that he died from like a dozen, you know, chimps attacking him with with bones. You know, it 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 That's might how it, he may have died. In that, my mind, he may have suffered a stroke from following beatings. from having been beaten. Yeah. Um, but uh, but you know what, what's actually really interesting is that uh, the man who ended up writing his obituary was famed physiologist Ivan Pavlov, which we all know from his experiments. Oh, my. Um, so these guys were all friends, and they all really wanted to understand uh, animals and man, and um, these bad scientists exist. So Dr. Langstrom, not so far away from... Oh, no. ...a potential no. reality. I, I mean, that speaks to the very real fact that um, illness... Medical illness and psychological psychological illness uh, does not discriminate. That certainly um, those things happen to anyone. And the people with access 
or the means to carry out these things can be some of the most dangerous people when it comes to unethical practice and these scientific so-called research studies. And to clarify any of that, nowadays we have these, you know, standards of ethics and practice, especially in terms of research. There are there are these guidelines and legal applications that um, make sure that both animals and humans are kept safe. These villains have very real psychological histories and backgrounds and motivations that um, we can certainly try to analyze and tease apart in very real ways. Great. Well, that uh, is our first episode of the Arkham Sessions. Uh, join us next week when uh, we get into an episode that you might actually have a little bit more appreciation for, Drea, um, because it introduces probably your favorite of the rogues gallery, the Joker. I'm very excited for this. Um, it's Christmas with the Joker coming up next week. Um, until then, I'm Brian Ward with Dr. Andrea Letamendi saying goodbye.